Thank you, Pastor Adrian. Welcome, everyone. Good to be together again. Welcome to our brethren online. As always, good to be together in spirit on this day. It is a beautiful Sabbath day here in wintry Canada. It's 46 degrees Fahrenheit, for those of you that speak Fahrenheit. It's, I've never seen it. I don't know that I've ever seen it this warm in February, ever. Last week, we covered a topic that is rarely discussed in the churches of God. Foot washing is discussed. I've seen messages on foot washing. But is foot washing a required part of Passover? That's what we discussed last week. Is it required? There's lots of lessons that uh, the various sermons give, but last week we discussed is foot washing a required part of Passover? We acknowledged the argument out there that because it is only mentioned in John's account of, uh, of Christ's last Passover with the disciples, that there wasn't enough evidence to some to accept that it is a required part of the evening. So as we begin today, I'd like to take a few minutes and go back and look at a little bit of what we uncovered last week as we introduced today's topic. Let's go back to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. When we were in Exodus, we read the following in the lead up to the receipt of the law at Sinai. Seven weeks or so following their exit from Goshen. We read in verse 3, Moses went up to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, God says. And you, sh you shall be to me, the children of Israel, as he describes them in verse 3, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, God says to Moses, which you shall speak to the children of Israel. They were to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We went through that last week as a precursor to looking at the requirement of foot washing at Passover. Let's go to Leviticus 10. We weren't there last week. We'll go there this week as we review some of the points we made last week. Leviticus chapter 10. Recall what we just read, that the children of Israel to be a kingdom of priests. That is the, this, this holy nation of priests. Leviticus 10. I believe Deacon Jan last year covered this profane fire of Nadab and Abihu. Verse 3, cutting into the context here, Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, regarding the priesthood, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So what his issue here with uh, Nadab and Abihu was that they were acting in an, un an unholy manner, act, uh, conduct unbecoming a priest, and that it was about their own glorification. You recall he went through that. It wasn't about the glorification of God, which was what the issue was that God had with them. So Aaron, of course, knew what Moses was saying. What God was saying through Moses was right, so he held his peace. Dropping down to verse 8, we see God speaking through Moses to tell Aaron, God saying to Aaron, actually, what the conduct of a priest, the, the priesthood would be this kingdom of priests that they were to be. The Lord spoke to Aaron saying, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You, nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. They were to be of sound mind, clear mindedness, for all that the priesthood was, to, all of their duties that they were to do. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. The purpose is here, and this is what, this was the need for the clear mindedness. They were not to have consumed any alcohol when they were going into the tabernacle, because they were to be able to distinguish between the holy and the unholy. And that was coming off of the terrible example that Nadab and Abihu had just committed with the profane fire. 
so you, that you may distinguish between the holy and the unholy and the clean and the unclean. And so there's a distinguishment here. They to have this discernment of being able to tell what was, what was good and bad, what was correct from God's point of view, what was evil. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord God has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So in a nutshell, this was what the job of the priesthood was to be. They were to be able to, to define and discern the difference between the holy and the unholy. And they were to be able to teach all of God's laws to the people. So as Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, ultimately, God would teach them how to be a kingdom of priests through one of the tribes that he had selected to actually be the physical priests through whom they would learn. We went to, and we won't go there today, we went to Hebrews chapter 5 and, and chapter 10, and we saw that this section of the letter to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 5 through 10, was really a study of Jesus Christ and how in the order of Melchizedek, he replaced the Levitical priesthood. And we certainly can't do justice to that topic of how Christ came to become the new high priest in, in even one sentence. It, it would be almost irresponsible to try and, and make any statement there. It's, it's such a deep topic. Uh, for that, check out, uh, remind you to check out Pastor Adrian's line upon line study on the book of Hebrews, given uh, several years ago now, actually, or one of Deacon's Jan ser uh, Deacon Jan's sermons, which he gave over the last couple of years, one titled King, uh, Christ, King or Priest, the other called From Sacrifice to Priest. So both, uh, both my brothers covered the Melchizedekian priesthood of Jesus Christ in very much in depth. But what we did last week was we went there to acknowledge and see that Christ replaced the Levitical priesthood. Let's now go to, with that in mind, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, reviewing what we covered last week, but with different scriptures, much like Pastor Adrian did with the name of God, uh, the two sermons on God's name. We're reviewing what we did last week, but we're going to use a few different scriptures. 1 Peter chapter 2. This helps understand what we covered in last week. Verse 4, we'll begin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. So Christ being the, the priest, the high priest, in the order of Melchizedek, chosen by God, we, through him, are being built up as a priesthood. Not the high priest, but a, a royal priesthood, much like what we read back in Exodus 19. To offer up spiritual sacrifices, and that was one of, that was one of the duties of the priesthood, to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, and here he's quoting from Isaiah, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him, and don't, don't oversimplify that phrase, we've covered that before, will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, and we did cover the meaning of belief last week about obedience, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, and there's, there's the definition right there through contrast, to those who believe he is precious, to those who are disobedient, i.e. who don't believe, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they were also were appointed. But you, contrasting back to those who are being called into Christ, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. The very words that God told Moses Israel would be his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light who were once not a people but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy by virtue and we covered this last week we uh, reminded ourselves we didn't read from there but we reminded ourselves from Romans 9 10 and 11 that by virtue of being grafted into this covenant through bap through our baptism and because of Christ's high priesthood, which we've just read about in, in uh, Hebrews and uh, 
yeah, in Hebrews, we are called to the same priesthood. That's what Peter's talking about here. We are called into his priesthood. We read that back in verse 4, that holy nation of priests called Israel. We reminded, we talked about that last week. With all that in mind, let's go back and catch a couple more scriptures that we actually did read last week. Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8. Here we know that God had selected, as we just discussed a few minutes ago, the tribe of uh, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, to be this initial group of priests through whom Israel would learn how to be priests. And we read here last week their consecration, how they were set apart as priests. Verse 6, Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the tunic on him, girded him with the sash, clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him, and he girded him with the intricately woven band of the ephod, and with it tied the ephod on him. Then he put the breastplate on him, and he put the urim and the thummim in the breastplate, and he put the turban on his head. Also on the turban on its front, he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And Moses took the anointing oil, and he anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, and consecrated them set them apart for service as priests, Aaron and his family. And we noticed what we saw there is the, the beginning of the consecration ceremony began with a complete washing of their bodies. Let's now go back to Exodus 30. We're nearing the end of the review here, but important that we do. Exodus chapter 30. So as they were made priests, they were set apart for priesthood. It began with a full body washing. What we see here now in Exodus 30, as they are building the tabernacle, and, the con and, and God is showing them what the, con what the contents of the tabernacle will be, we come to this contraption inside the, the, the tabernacle called the bronze laver. Verse 17 says of Exodus 30, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, you shall make a laver of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. So we've all got sinks at home. Back in the, the older older uh, decades, it would be wash basins that we, that we would have. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting inside the door and the altar. So between the entrance to, to the tabernacle and between the, the altar. And you shall put water in it, for Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet in water for, from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, all of those things that we read about, that there was their duty to do as, as the priesthood, whenever they were to come into the, the, the tabernacle and perform those duties, the first thing they were to do was to wash their hands and their feet. They shall wash with water. Looking back at verse 19, they're clarifying their hands and their feet, lest they die. Verse 21, so shall they wash their hands and their feet, lest they die. So repeated twice. They must do this, lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and his descendants, throughout their generations. So any subsequent entrance into the tabernacle, after their consecration with the full body wash, any subsequent entrance in the tabernacle, or to come near to the altar in the tabernacle, to sacrifice required the washing of feet and obviously their hands as well. John 13. John 13. So all of that, consequentially, this led us back to John to see Christ's clarification of his command to wash one another's feet. So we started in John, went and did all of this review, and then consequentially we come back, back to John and discuss and read what Christ had said. John 13. We won't take time to read the whole account. We did that more than once last week. But we'll start in verse 9. Simon Peter, cutting into the context, you, uh, let's go back to uh, verse 4. Then he came to Simon, verse 6, sorry. Then he came to Simon Peter 
And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And we talked about, we talked about that. Peter said, said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him and said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my, my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Just wash all of me. And Jesus said, he was bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. Those who are bathed, we could, by extrapolation, read into that baptized into the priesthood or consecrated into the priesthood. And we are, we are by virtue of our baptism, um, as we read in 1 Peter, part of those, those stones of the priesthood need only wash their feet before taking, partaking of the sacrifice. And we made that very clear connection using, using what John had said and then what uh, God in the Torah said to show that this foot washing that we partake of before the Passover symbols, the sacrificial symbols of the Passover, is a requirement for the priesthood. Verse 8, as we just read, if you do not wash, if you do not wash, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me, explains the seriousness of this statement from Christ. But this wasn't just one thing John dreamed up 60 years later, and now we debate whether it's important or not. This is rather critical here to our participation in the sacrificial symbols of the Passover. We concluded that this offers a Torah-based explanation of the necessity of foot washing of Passover. Most groups have always said it, we do it because we follow Jesus Christ's example, and that's a completely valid statement. But much more than just that, it's this, this understanding of the Torah and the, how the priesthood were to, to act and behave in the Torah makes it a necessity. The response to last week's sermon was interesting. Rarely do I hear from so many people after a message, and I got several messages that came through to me with many insights. The insights of other brethren that they had was evidence to me that many of you take this ceremony very seriously. Seriously enough to have considered what we should be learning from this command to wash one another's feet. And there were lots of, lots of, of opinions and thoughts as to what, what it makes it important to you. Why do you, what you think of when you kneel before a brother or a sister's feet. So last week, in covering the requirement to include foot washing at Passover, you remember that I said that the benefits are not proof of the requirement. There are certainly benefits, but they're not proof of the requirement. However, there are beneficial lessons to be learned. And since we covered last week the, re the requirement, today, now that we know it is a necessary part of the Passover service, let's dig a little deeper into the subject today and consider the benefits. What should we be learning from washing one another's feet? So we are, as much like what we read there where the Levitical priesthood was to teach the nation of Israel what it meant to be the priests of God. It is more than just, it is more than just blind obedience to doing a task that God says. That's initially part of it. You recall Christ in John 13 said, you may not understand, but you will. The not understanding part is where the, is where the faithful, I shouldn't have said blind obedience, I'll say faithful obedience comes in, where we obey simply because we know it to be a requirement. And as we proceed, and we've been doing this for, I've been doing it for 31 years now, 31, 32 years, I think I said, we learn every year something a little bit more. So what should we be learning as part of washing part of the ceremony. That's what we'll look at today. I learned a new word this week in my studies. Well, I learned what it actually really means, actually. And I'd heard the word before and sort of dismissed it many years ago. I heard of it many years ago after many that I had grown up worshiping with as a child left the faith for other pastors. A couple of leaders who turned to Anglicanism, I found in uh, internet research, began keeping Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Does anyone know, and feel free to, if you do, just shout it out, 
I won't be able to hear you, but I'll hear people here. Does anyone know what precedes Good Friday on Thursdays? It's louder. Last Wednesday is Wednesday, but on Thursday. Maundy Thursday. So someone said Shrove, Shrove, that's Shrove Tuesday, Ash Wednesday, Maundy Thursday. Maundy Thursday is kept by many Catholic and Orthodox related churches, and it has specifically to do with the washing of the saints' feet. Not surprisingly, Maundy is of Latin origin, hence the connection to Catholicism. And that explains why I had never really heard of it before, because the scriptures are in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. But in some Catholic-based churches, they keep what's called Maundy Thursday. And this word Maundy actually means the washing of the saints' feet. That name comes from 1 Timothy 5. Let's turn to, turn to 1 Timothy 5. Here's where they get that, that name from. The Latinized version of it. And we here in 1 Timothy 5, we're, we see Paul is instructing the body of Christ on the treatment of widows. Let's take a look here. Verse 3. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. So even in our, even in our advanced age, our widowhood, what we do and what we say and how we behave is not lost on our Father. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone doesn't provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's how important taking care of each other is, taking care of our families. Paul continues now, verse 9, with the test of true widowhood. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless... She has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. And if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, and if she has diligently followed every good work. This is the test of true widowhood from God's perspective that he, he provided through Paul. But refuse the younger widows, he continues, and reading this the first time, I was blown away by Paul's, Paul's instructions here because typically, you know, church is taught to not turn the other cheek and to serve everyone and, every, and everybody. And, and here, Paul has some very strict um, um, qualifications for what it means to be a widow that deserves the support of the church. But refuse the younger widows for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ— and that means unfaithful. They desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. It's that type of behavior that shockingly, unshockingly actually, but Paul actually has qualifications in there for widows. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, and give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some have already turned aside after Satan, and if any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. So an unfaithful or a, a widow that was, was young enough to, to, to still be married and look at, and be looked after or had family that was, was responsible for her or hadn't been productive during her productive years was not to be looked after by the church. This part of this part of the test that Paul calls true, true widowhood, what we see here as we go through this is their level of service to the body of Christ when they were able. And the washing of the feet while a literal part of the culture at that time, and it was a literal part of the culture, is 
based on its place in this list of qualifiers, an example of service. That while we are, while we are able, we are to be of service to the body of Christ. Service reflects productivity. In, in contrast to being idle, go, uh, gossips and busybodies. And I'm sure if you, I'm sure as I say, idle, gossips and busybodies, faces come to mind. Maybe it's your face, I hope not. But we all, we all have come across busybodies in our, in, our, in our, I hope it's not within the body of Christ. I hope it's in our, in our, our, our secular lives. But productivity is part of what was the test of a true widow that deserved support from the church. Because service reflects productivity. With that in mind, let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. As we consider the washing of the feet of the saints. What lessons we can learn from kneeling before a brother or a sister and washing their feet. 1 Corinthians 11. This productive service in the body. <clears throat> Verse 26 is where we'll go. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup... 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But, so contrasting, contrasting the concept of being unworthy, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner drinks judgment to the Lord himself not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body. We see this reflected, this, this concept of productivity to the body of Christ, reflected here in Paul's warning. And we certainly don't have time to dig into this too deeply. I'll remind you uh, that Pastor Adrian gave a message on discerning the Lord's body and then a few, many years ago and then updated it a few years ago. So go online to, to follow that and find that message and and hear him exegete that part of the scripture in much more detail than we can now. But as we consider this concept of not discerning the Lord's body, just briefly, that word diacrino, as we know, is often translated into the word judge. But in this sense here, it means to make a distinction of or to prefer. That as we, as we consider the body of Christ and coming into the Passover to discern, there's a distinction we need to make between the body of Christ and those that are not of the body of Christ. Because if you recall what we read back in Leviticus, part of the job of the priesthood, which we are, are, to be, are coming under Christ as priests in his priesthood, was to be able to discern between the holy and the unholy and the clean and the unclean. So discernment is part of the, the, the makeup of a priest of God, a priest of Christ. And when we come into that, into, into the Passover, making a distinction between those who are of the body and those who are not is important. And we can leap off a whole lot of different directions there as far as who's able to participate in foot washing, but that is all interconnected. We won't do that here today. But when we come together, while Paul, while Paul doesn't cover specifically the washing of feet here, which he, he does, Paul doesn't cover Cover it specifically as it relates to the Passover in any of his writings, and here would have been perfect, and he didn't. When we come together to discern the Lord's body, waiting for each other before we eat, and kneeling in service to wash the feet of a saint helps drive that point home. So while we cut, we when we come together to eat, and then we kneel before a brother or a sister to wash their feet, discerning the Lord's body is all part of that. We wait until everybody's here. We kneel before a brother or a sister in the faith and wash their feet. It takes discernment. It takes recognizing that there's a distinction between those who are of the, of the body and those who are not. Let's go to, as we consider this, one of the, one of the greater lessons of washing feet, being, being serving the saints. That's really what, what where we're on here now is to serving each other, discerning the body of Christ, serving each other through productive service. 
Let's go now to 1 Samuel 25. This is the story of David and Nabal. David and Nabal. 1 Samuel 25. And as you're turning there, again, we don't have time to go into the whole story, read the whole chapter. But while in, while in the wilderness, David's men ask a wealthy man named Nabal for supplies. Nabal refuses, insults David and his men in the process, and refuses to help them. David, that stirred up a little anger in him, and he was, was intending on killing Nabal and his servants for this, this offense that was caused to him. But his wife, Nabal's wife, Abigail, interceded on his, her husband's behalf and convinced David not to kill Nabal. So let's go to verse 23. Pick, the, pick up the story there. When, da- when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. So David, at this point, is the, is the next in line to be, to be the king of Israel. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, because vengeance one of the lessons David was to learn was that vengeance belongs to God. He could be as upset as he could be, as he could be with Nabal. He was not to take vengeance. That was God's prerogative, which is what turned him into, you recall much later on, a man of war, and then David couldn't ultimately do the building of the, the temple. But that's We won't get off on that tangent. Let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. So, so lay Nabal's uh, sin on me. I, 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 will, I will accept responsibility for this and forgive me. For the, the Lord, the Most High, will certainly make for my Lord, you David, the next king of Israel, an enduring house. Because my Lord, David, fights the battles of the Most High. And evil is not found in you through your days. So much like, it almost sounds a little bit like Moses trying to tell God, you know, remember what you promised here? Don't be like this. Here, Abigail is telling David, you've got so much, you've got such a future here. Don't be dragged down by this. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the, of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel. So she knew, it was well known, evidently enough, that he, David was going to be the next ruler of Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. When the Lord has dealt with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. And David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. God sent you to talk me off of the ledge, to stop me from doing something that I shouldn't do, that I know to be wrong, but I just had my physical anger riled up so much so that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't see to do right. Blessed be God for sending you to me. And clearly her understanding of David as the next king of Israel was clear. And she understood the need to trust and rely on the most high God of Israel for vengeance. So clearly... She, she, she was a believer of some sort, whatever that means back then, enough to talk David and convince David to do right. After God then took the life of Nabal, which he ended up doing for his evil treatment of David, we pick this up in verse 39. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. The Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. And David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife. 
When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Notice what she committed to here. She is, is now a, a clearly a believer of some sort in the most high God of Israel, understood some of his tenets, like vengeance is mine, and that David was to be the next king. And in return for this offer of, of a marriage, when the servants of David, or, or, sorry, verse 41, then she arose, bowed her face to the earth and said, here is your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. A servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. David takes her as his wife and she commits herself out of gratitude for being rescued, I suppose, from an evil man to now being the wife of the king of Israel to a life of service to him. And not just to him, I won't serve you. I'll actually serve your servants. I'll be the one that washes the feet of your servants. That's how grateful I am. I won't need to, I won't wash your feet. I'll wash the feet of your servants. Just a quick side note. She would later become the mother of David's son, Chilion. So when we come to Passover and recommit ourselves to the covenant we made, which is part of our preparation, the individual preparation and then the collective preparation, the covenant we, that we made, that we were grafted into at baptism, do we realize that we are committing ourselves in service to the body of Christ again for the coming year? We aren't just committing ourselves to God, although we are. We're committing ourselves to Christ, which we are. But by virtue of that commitment to the Father and to the Messiah, we're also committing to his body. This requires a deep understanding of service and humility. So, yes, humility is one of the lessons we learn when we get down on our knees and wash a buddy's feet. But it's so much more than just checking a box off, getting down on our knees, washing each other's feet for that one time, having a bit of a giggle about it, and getting on to the bread and the wine. We are telling our Father, we are telling Jesus Christ, and we are telling the body that we are committed to service again for this year. So through humility, through service, all of those, all of those character, character qualities that we, that we think of that we learn at, at foot washing, it really boils down to service and serving the body. Let's now switch gears and look at a different lesson, one of these greater lessons, wide ranging lessons. Let's go to Luke chapter seven. We would be remiss if in discussing foot washing, we didn't go to this account as we take a look at service, but this time, we're going, to, we're going to switch here and talk about service to our Lord and Master, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 7. This account has been covered by many speakers in many messages over the years, including many from this pulpit as well. Her treatment of Jesus Christ here, with not only with expensive oil, but by washing his feet with her tears, stands out as a shining example of service to him and her intense emotional example of being in the presence of Christ, the fact that she would have tears flowing by being in his presence. This intense emotion that she felt just being in Christ's presence is a lesson that we can take as well. And again, we could spend, as many have, an entire message just building off of this scripture. But let's just look at a couple of things here for the purposes of this message today. Verse 31, uh, sorry, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city was a sinner, who was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. She kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, mumbling under his breath, this man, if he were really a prophet, 
who would who would know who and what manner of what this woman is if he was really a prophet he would know what she is what she's like and who's touching him for she is a sinner but when she found out that Christ was eating at this Pharisee's house nothing was going to stop her from coming to him imagine this disdain that this man felt for her like she look at him look at him let her touch him she's such a sinner it was a personal invitation into his house and somehow she got in the front door and attended this dinner that is being hosted by someone who absolutely hated her that that shows some sort of commitment that when she knew and it says there when she knew he was at this this house she was she was finding a way to get into his presence it makes you wonder how in the world she found her way in but in context this this Example that Luke is talking about here, the context actually goes back to verse 31. Let's go there. Because this is contrasted by what happened immediately before Christ went to this dinner. And the Lord said, verse 31, To what then shall I liken the men of this generation? Remember how, she, how he spoke, the Pharisee spoke of her as this, this good-for-nothing sinner? Listen to what Christ had to say about him and his friends and his fellow Pharisees. To what then shall I liken the men of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace. They're just, a, they're just boys. They have the maturity, the mindset of little boys. Calling to one another, saying, Who played the flute for you, and you didn't dance? We mourn to you, and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said, He has a demon. He doesn't drink. He doesn't eat terrible, so he must, he must be filled with demons. The Son of Man, he comes eating and drinking. He does the opposite, and... And he's a glutton and a wine bibber. Kind of sounds like the media today, quite frankly. You're, no matter what you do, you're going to be on the wrong side of everybody. But wisdom is justified by all her children. And then he goes in to talk about what wisdom is. Faith in Christ. And just, just the desire to be in his presence. That she would, she would go into a place that thinks evil of her. Imagine, imagine going into the offices, you hear Jesus Christ is somehow dining with the, the leaders of Planned Parenthood for whatever reason. And you're going to go into, that, into these offices of people that you know hate everything you stand for. That's what she did here. She went, into, she went into a place that hated her just so she could be near her Savior and her Messiah. Interesting that Christ still accepted a dinner invitation by these people that he called children. He, he cast, castigates them here as, as mere boys and then accepts a dinner invitation so that he could teach a lesson here about the wisdom of the meek. Wisdom of this, this simple woman who gave all she had and just wanted to be in the presence of her Savior. I mentioned that several people sent, sent stuff to me as part of their thoughts, one brother pointed this out to me. In verse, we'll go down to verse 42. That there was an element, and we see here, there was an element of forgiveness that was also associated with her expression of service to Christ. He then proceeds to talk about the parable of the two debtors. Verse 40, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had done nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. I came into your house. and I am the Messiah that you, that you and your, your fellow leaders have been talking about for centuries. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has, washed, she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. She didn't have the water, but she used her tears. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. She can't afford this, but she's, she is giving all she can because I am in her presence. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, he acknowledged her sins are many. She did not live a life that was 
conducive to, to a follower of Christ. But she had faith. And she could, she could, nothing stopped her from seeing her Messiah. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. An amazing story of what it means to, through the power of foot washing, understand that not only are we to serve each other, we are to commit to a life of service to our Savior. Let's go to John 12. John 12. Another example of foot washing that we can glean a lesson from. John 12, verse 1. And six days before the Passover, it begins in John 13. We've studied there many, many times. So we're just, we're coming up on less than a week before Passover here. Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, Lazarus's two sisters. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. I'm sure you can picture that now with, with aromatherapy and things that you might have in your house, that the whole house was, was filled with the scent. Dropping down to verse 7 in reaction to, well, let's read verse 4. we got time. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and used to take what was put in it, which again speaks to what we were talking about here locally in our pre-sermon discussion, that he was always of evil intent. But verse 7, Jesus said, Let her alone, for she has kept this day of my burial. For the poor you have always with you, but me you do not have with you always. So just before Passover, we find Mary having just witnessed the resurrection of her brother, preparing the Messiah's body in her own way, in the only way she could for burial. And that was with this expensive oil. And she did it through washing of her feet. It's just her and her, ma- her and her Savior, her and her Master. She was using this, this opportunity of foot washing to, to learn, and we, and we learn from her example what it means to serve our master. Let's go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. We find ourselves approximately 14 years after the events of Genesis 14 and 15. We mentioned those last week. It's been covered in several messages here over the last number of years. When Abram had bread and wine with the high priest Melchizedek in chapter 14. The next night in chapter 15, and that next night, we, when you study, is the self-same night that years later, his, Abram's descendants would leave Goshen which now adds up to that night that he had bread and wine with Melchizedek. The following night, when that selfsame night, when his his descendants would would depart from Goshen, you can do the math. God caused him to sleep, and God performed his part, his unconditional part of the covenant. We now come 14 years later and pick up the account in verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am, the, I am Almighty God, I am the Most High. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall no longer be a, fa- and you shall be a father of many nations. Oh, there's where no longer came in. Sorry. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. 
and kings shall come from you. That nation of that holy nation of kings and priests that his that his children were to become. And I establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant, an unending everlasting covenant that we know we've been grafted into, to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now we get to the covenant part, verse 9. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout, your gen- throughout their generations. And this is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. This is what the sign will be. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not in your descendant. So here, God establishes the sign of the covenant. God did his part. But now, Abraham was to do his part. And what his part was to be in accepting that covenant was to circumcise the foreskin of all the male children. Verse 19, we'll, we'll drop down to verse 19, where we see God establishes the difference. We talked earlier about discerning the difference between the holy and the unholy, between the chosen and the unchosen. We see this here, interestingly, the difference between Isaac and Ishmael. Then God said no, referring to Sarah's question here. Sarah shall, uh, Abraham's question, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son and shall call his name Isaac. Abraham wanted it to be Ishmael. And I will establish my covenant with him, with Isaac, for an everlasting covenant with his descendants after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you, and I've honored you. You're a faithful follower of mine, so I hear you. What I'm going to do, I've blessed him. I will bless Ishmael, and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. And he shall beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. We know what that has led to. We won't go off on a tangent there, but it's important here. This is where it started. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac. I'm, I will make Ishmael great, but my covenant will be with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year, 12 months from today. And he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. We see, we won't take time to read the next five verses, but what we see in the last part of that chapter is Abraham fulfills his part of the covenant by circumcising all the men in his family, including the servants in his household. Abraham obeyed God and agreed to come into covenant with the Most High through the circumcision of all the males in his household. So following the covenant that God confirmed with him, Abraham's acceptance through the circumcision of that of his of the male children of the, the males in his household, the Lord appeared to him, chapter 18 and verse 1, immediately following this acceptance. The one who would become Christ appeared with two angels to Abraham. The Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I now have found favor in your sight, this is worshipful language. He knew who this was. If I now have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Abraham acknowledged him as Lord, as his Lord. He then ensured that his feet were washed before serving them bread and a fine meal. Now, of course, we don't know whether it was Abraham himself who washed their feet or whether he had his servants wash their feet. The Bible doesn't say But what we do know is that immediately following his covenant-accepting circumcision, the one who who would become Messiah appeared to him, and there was a washing of feet. That Abraham, the first thing he did before he had had the food made, was acknowledge that sit here and let's let's have your feet washed. There's, There's something about 
understanding service to Christ. In addition to serving, serving the saints, serving Christ through these powerful lessons of foot washing that we find strewn throughout the scriptures. Service to Christ comes in many various forms, as many of you conveyed in your comments to me last week. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. Deacon Jan mentioned this verse in a sermon last year, I think, and a brother reminded me of it this week. So I wanted to bring this possible lesson to your attention, share it with you that he shared with me. Because service to Christ comes in many, many forms. Serving him through his, serving his body, serving him directly as, as many did in the pages of, of the Holy Scriptures. But in Leviticus chapter 1, in verse 8, we read the following. Then the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head, and the fat in, in order on the wood that is on the fire in the altar, but he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water. So what we see here, in preparation for the voluntary burnt offering, this was a, a, an offering that was completely voluntary, but that it was to be completely consumed. It was, it was unedible after this. It was to be completely consumed. That's why it's called the burnt offering. Before it was entirely consumed by fire, the inside parts and the legs and the feet were washed with water. And this sacrifice brought a sweet aroma to the Most High. And as we heard last year, and as this brother pointed out, there's an element here of, of sacrifice to Christ. That when we, when we get on our knees and wash each other's feet and understand that we're washing the feet of the saints, but also understanding that, that we, through the washing of the feet of the saints, we are also washing through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within them, that we are washing the feet of Christ as well, the way Christ mentioned in John 13, through, through extrapolation. That this commitment to honoring Christ also comes with, part of that comes with sacrifice. And we see here the, the, the washing of the legs, which, which would also include the feet as part of the, the burnt offering to a, a brother that sent this to me. And I thought there was some merit to that that we can also learn the concept of sacrifice. When we learn these two overarching lessons of, of serving the body of Christ and serving Jesus Christ, sometimes that service to Christ comes with sacrifice. And we see that in John 15. We see that lesson in John 15, immediately following their actual foot washing and the keeping of the Passover symbols. John 15 is in his final address to his disciples that evening. John 15, Christ was preparing them for what it means to follow him, what it means to serve him. Verse 18, if the world hates you, he was prepping them for this, you know that it hated me before it hated you. So if they're going to hate you, they're hating you because they hate me. If you were of the world, if you were part of them, the world would love you because you're part of them. And Never has this been more clear and understandable than today. We clearly get today what it means to be a follower of Christ or a hater of Christ. It would be so much easier to get through this life to, be, to, go, to go with the flow and be a hater of Christ. If you're only focused on the physical, that would be much easier. But this life may require and does require sacrifice, and that's what Christ is preparing them for on this evening. If you're of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. And we heard over the course of two messages the importance of what it means to, for his name's sake, for, by his reputation. And so with, therefore, when we are, are persecuted, we are persecuted, and by extension, we, 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 sub, we accept that for the, the, the sake of his reputation. John 21, not many days later, 
Christ revisits this, this concept of sacrifice might mean more than just getting on your knees. It might mean the actual giving up of your life. And he, in John 21, he says to Peter, most assuredly in verse 18, I say to you, when you were younger, you, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. When you were younger, you called your own shots, you dressed yourself, you went wherever you, th- you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you, another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. He wasn't really speaking of the aging process. What he was speaking of, this he spoke, John, John clarifies, signifying by what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, Christ said to Peter, follow me. And even in death, what John is reminding us all those centuries later, that Peter, Peter, by the time John wrote this down, Peter had been dead for a couple of, a couple of decades, that this death would glorify God, would glorify our Father. And that is what Peter was called to. It's what the disciples were called to. And by extension, that is what we are called to do. And as when we kneel before a brother or a sister, we are committing to that level of service to Jesus Christ. These are the things that should go through our mind when we are on our knees before a brother or a sister and washing their feet. It's not just checking off a box on a, on a, on a checklist. But these are some of the things that should, should impact us as we're considering that. There's so much for us to contemplate as we ready ourselves for Passover. As much as the taking of the bread and the wine is critical to the, that evening, the eating of the bread, the, the drinking of the wine is, is the symbols that we, that we partake of that, that reflect our true inner commitment, again, for the following year to Jesus Christ, to his way. So, quite frankly, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, foot washing is a paramount part of that as well. It's not just, as I've said numerable times over the last two weeks, getting on our knees and washing a buddy's feet. It is so much more than that. Not only is it a requirement, there are, there are deep lessons of service and sacrifice to the body and to him that we, that we are to learn. So as we conclude here, let's go to where Sister Caitlin read in Deuteronomy 33. Got a couple of scriptures to conclude with. Deuteronomy 33, and we're going there because we've been called to be priests. And here, as Moses was preparing the children of Israel for life without him, life on the other side of the Jordan in the promised land without him, he talks about each of the tribes. So let's go to verse 8 and read what he talked about, the tribe of uh, the Levitical tribe. What was his, his, his parting words? to the tribe that would be the, that were the priests. Verse 8, And of Levi he said, Let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One. Pause there as we read that and go back to what we, what we read about the, the consecration of the priesthood. They were given this ephod and this Urim and the Thummim, these jewels that were put in the, the, uh, in the, the breastplate of the ephod. And they were the decision makers. They were, they were what the priest used to make decisions through the, the prayerful uh, intervention of God. And we don't have time to go into that, but it was, really, it was really how they would make decisions. But it was done through following God's commandments and his expectations for the priest. Where they, would put on, they would put on the cloak, put on the breastplate, and in the breastplate was this ephod, and this is how they were to behave. Let your, let your decision-making be the proper way. As leaders of God's people, he said to the Levites, know how to make the right decisions. And in this case, then, it was through the, through the Thummim and the Urim. Remembering that you tested, you tested him at Massah, and, and with, with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah. They were perfect. God, they, were, they, they, through their testing of God, had to prove to him to themselves. Who says of his father and his mother, I have not seen them nor did he acknowledge his brothers or nor his own children. Again, imperfect human beings, but God was using them. He would use them to, in the role of priests to teach his people. So they have observed your word and kept your covenant. 
they, this priesthood, shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. This is what was expected of the priesthood. They shall put incense before you. They were to be part of the sacrificial system and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. And what were they to do when they were to come into that sacrifice? They were to wash their hands and their feet every single time. Bless his substance, Lord. Put a special blessing upon this group of priests, this group of men, this, this tribe. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hand. Accept his work as, as priest. Accept their work as priests. Strike the loins of those who rise against him. Keep him protected and safe because there are those, if they are following God's ways, there are those that want to persecute him. That we, and we see that strewn throughout the scriptures. And of those who hate him, that they, may, that they rise not again. Moses is blessing upon the priesthood and his expectations of the, the, that priesthood to teach, to sacrifice, and to be the shining example of what it means to be holy. Let's conclude in John 13, having now walked through the necessity of, of the foot washing and now the lessons that we should take from that ceremony. John 13. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said to Peter, What I am doing, do not understand now, but you will know after this. I hope together we understand a little bit more about what it means to wash feet and the importance of this, this ritual that, quite frankly, I'll admit, I probably walked through too many times in my life, not understanding its depth. But the more we do it, the more we trust God, the more we, we appreciate everything he tells us to do, we will know after this. We will get to understand. The more, the more we want to understand, the more he will give us to understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And the most important part of this whole thing, Jesus said, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me conversation's over. Let's just part ways. And if later on in 14, what we see here, Shire, verse 14 and 15, if I do this to you, you should be doing this to one another. And that should wasn't a, if you feel like it. It was the same should and same intensity that he said, you'll have no part with me. So as we prepare in earnest for the beginning of this year's holy day season, in a little over 10 weeks from now, and time flies, do not overlook the all-important a necessary part of the ceremony where we wash the feet of a fellow saint. Not only is it mandatory for a chosen generation of royal priests, which we are, but it is replete with lessons that should change us. It should prepare us for another year of service to our high priest and to his body of 